Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be classifying organic compounds based on their solubility in water and I'm going to be classifying those in terms of their function groups, which one could possibly dissolve in water and up to what limit. Obviously we're talking about how many carbons or how big the compound needs to be in order to be able to uh, dissolve in water if at all. Before we go actually into details and I'll make in a chart here, I want to talk about uh, a few terms, something like uh, soluble versus non-soluble and miscible versus immiscible. And uh, obviously, if I want to start out with something being soluble versus non-soluble, obviously, we're talking about having a some sort of solid solute and you're dissolving that in a very small amount of water. So when we're trying to test the solubility, it's typically you want to dissolve, I would say, maybe less than 50 milligram of a solid into less than one milliliters of water. So that's like, like the rough range of the solubility testing. And as soon as you add the solid in the water, suppose, and if you don't see the solid anymore, that means it would dissolve in the water. And a typical example being sodium chloride, when you add that in the water, it you don't see that anymore because it has been dissolved. And the same can be said about the sugar. As soon as you put the sugar in water, it's not you don't really see it anymore, so that means it has been dissolved in the water. So that's the first thing you want to be testing. And obviously that applies to if you testing an organic compound that is indeed solid in nature. But now, if you what if you have if you're dealing with an organic compound that is actually already in a liquid at room temperature, so then you don't really call them being soluble versus non-soluble, rather use terms called an immiscible and immiscible. Now, what's really an immiscible and immiscible uh, really means? Like, uh, you know, if I give, take a really good example, and uh, when you add water, and um, I can talk about maybe consuming alcohol, you don't really see those being separated. They mix really well. It makes just one uniform homogeneous mixture. So that's what miscible really mean. And if I take another example that specifies immiscible, that could be a water and oil. Like when you mix water and oil, and even if you can talk about gasoline, um, they don't really mix up that well because they don't really like one another because of their polarity and they do separate out and they make two different layers so that's going to be called an immiscible or you can compare immiscible to be something being non-soluble so that's what you're really going to be looking into if you mixing two liquids with one another and if they do mix up really well makes some homogeneous mixture that means they do dissolve with one another or they are miscible, but if they don't really like one another and they separate out in terms of making two different phases or two different layers, then they are going to be insoluble in that particular water. So here we're really going to be testing the solubilities in water. We're not really going to be testing in organic solvents because they, if something doesn't really dissolve in water, there's a good chance it will dissolve in the organic solvent. But then at the same time, if something dissolves in water, there's still a good chance it will dissolve in an organic solvent, such as like, you know, an ether or an ethyl acetate. So that's, you know, we don't, we're not really going to be talking about the organic solvents. We're just going to be trying to characterize those in terms of the solubility in water. So let's say I have a compound. And I'm trying to dissolve that in water. So the question you want to ask yourself, does it dissolve in water or no? So if the answer is yes to that, it does dissolve in water. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the right side here. And if the answer is no here, so it doesn't really dissolve in water. So those are going to be your, um, you know, no means insoluble. And yes means they do dissolve. Now, typically, if you're looking at a compound, that organic compound, especially that dissolves in water, and it would contain all different types of these function groups, uh, ranging from alcohols to all the way to maybe an acid or ester, we're typically looking at organic compounds that are relatively small in nature in terms of carbons. And uh, if I kind of give you a rough idea, we're looking at anywhere between less than five to six carbons. 
all right so maybe anywhere between one carbon two carbons or up to five to six carbons there is a good chance they would dissolve in water but if you have any organic compounds technically except the sugars the sugars is a different story and amino acids as well if they you have relatively larger compound and we're looking at you know six carbons and more and obviously it does have an upper limit we're not really going to talk about that but if you have those six carbons or more and that could have any sort of these functional groups uh, um, from alcohols to acids and anything so they would not dissolve in water because of the hydrophobic nature kind of takes over the polarity in that case so then you know let's kind of come down to the left side here and we said okay yes it does dissolve in water and uh, the next thing you really want to do if something is soluble in water and if it does dissolve I want to go ahead and check the pH of that particular solution and uh, to check the pH all I'm really doing is you know either using the litmus paper or using the pH paper so if the pH all right so let's say we're doing the pH testing here And if the pH is, you know, if the litmus paper comes out to be um, <clears throat> pink to red in color, that means it's going to be an acidic. Now, now you want to think of what function groups you really have that are actually going to be acidic in nature. So that actually comes down to having just maybe carboxylic acid. So maybe you're looking at having a carboxylic acid or something that's actually relatively stronger organic acid maybe I can talk about having some sort of phenol but you need to have a lot of electron withdrawing groups but for right now we're just going to be focusing on okay we are looking at in a carboxylic acid here if the pH indeed comes out to be uh, red in color but let's say if your pH paper turns out to be maybe green to bluish then we are looking at a basic uh, organic compound something that has in a basic uh, function group on here and then what organic compounds really have function, uh, basic function groups well those are going to be your amines so we are going to be having amines in those particular category and then anything that actually gives you a neutral pH doesn't really change the color of the litmus paper or the pH paper so that means they are neutral then we are looking at any other function groups that are kind of left out and uh, we are looking at maybe having an aldehyde in this particular category we're looking at having an uh, alcohol in that particular category as well and uh, we're looking at having ketones as well so that actually puts you in, in a bigger range here including esters now remember we're talking about all these things that are going to be relatively small in nature they are going to be only having oh, really got that extra there we are looking at only having five to six carbons or less than that the other thing that you could technically have that would dissolve in the water as well and you may not to get um, really uh, any changes in the pH it could be your sugars you know think about glucose uh, sucrose they do dissolve in water and they are not really going to be having a, any changes in the pH and the other thing about these sugars they are not really limited to how many carbons they can have like sucrose has 12 carbons in there obviously glucose has six carbons in there but the really reason why they are really dissolving in there because of their uh, polyfunctional group so I can maybe go ahead and put this in that category as well here so for polyfunctional groups that are gonna be your um, sugars um, sucrose glucose and all those things because they have so many uh, polar function groups on here they would dissolve in water okay now let's come down to the other side what we really got that are going to be insoluble that actually going to give you a lot of problems here because now you could technically have anything the first thing i want to look for is that actually would not dissolve in water would be your obviously your alkenes and alkynes would be there your um alkyl halides would be there 
And uh, it doesn't matter how many carbons you really have on those guys, as long as, because they are kind of relatively nonpolar to uh, begin with. So it's going to be any carbon add, uh, any carbon numbers on those, whether it's two, three, four, or all the way to maybe like nine, ten. It does have an upper limit, so we're not going to be talking about those, however. But then, in addition to those, you could also have the rest of these guys uh, where I could still have an alcohol, I could still have this, even the carboxylic acid and aldehydes, and every, any one of those. So maybe I can just, you know, go ahead and get those out right here. I'll get the amide as well, I'll get the ester as well, and I'll get the carboxylic acid as well. So all these guys could potentially be insoluble in water, Obviously, um, that along with the amines, I don't want to leave that out here. And they, as long as they have maybe six carbons or more, that's just kind of an, a general number there. Um, because as soon as you start getting more than six carbons, it um, the the hydrophobic effect kind of um, takes the priority, the nonpolar side, so it doesn't really make them dissolve in the water. So what you can technically do at this point to test to what particular function group you're really looking into, you could do a couple of things. First, I want to go ahead and check the solubility of these things in maybe aqueous NaOH. Or you, maybe they would say 5% NaOH. Any one of those are, should be okay. So we're testing the solubility of these compounds that were actually insoluble in water in the base now. So what would happen? Let's say, yes, we get some compounds that are going to be soluble, and obviously we're going to have some compounds that are going to be insoluble. All right, so the, the one that are actually going to be soluble, remember this is a base, so I'm really looking at anything that's going to have an acidic functional group in there, and uh, that really comes down to the carboxylic acid. So we can have carboxylic acids there that would dissolve in water, uh, dissolve in this um, basic water here. Uh, what else you could technically have? I could have um, any like any other acidic uh, functional groups, maybe phenols and its uh, derivatives. I can have even diketones. And uh, any other organic acid that uh, that could technically um, is going to be relatively stronger and would be able to uh, deprotonate by the NaOH. But those are the most common ones. So you could have either carboxylic acids, the uh, the phenols and its derivatives, and maybe you could have the diketones because diketones does have an acidic uh, uh, hydrogen in there that has a relatively uh, low pKa of nine to ten. Now, what if that doesn't dissolve in NaOH? Then that leaves you with every other categories in there. Like I can just go ahead and get these down here. So obviously I want to go ahead and take out the carboxylic acid. The rest of them still could be there. That's the whole point. All right, so now what I really want to do here to test those further, maybe I can test them in, in a, 5% HCl. If I test those in 5% HCl, now I'm testing those in the HCl solution, which is an acidic solution. So what if I have those to be dissolved? So some of them may dissolve because they will do an acid-base reaction. And the most common one that would actually really do the acid-base reaction would be anything that's going to be basic. So what are the really basic function groups you really have in there? And that's actually going to be your amine. So that's the only thing that's going to come down on this side. And you don't really have anything else. There's really not any other compound that's going to be relatively basic in there. So that's really going to be the five, uh, that's what's really going to be the case here. Now you may wonder that 5% HCl may react with the alkenes and alkynes, but remember this is very dilute HCl, so it may not actually do the job that you're expecting it to do. So then the other thing that's really going to be left now to do and you know you may actually may, may not do it in the lab but let's say you do it in some sort of lab so let's say this is going to be what's insoluble here and we are looking at 
the remaining function groups there. So I'm going to go ahead and copy those down. All those comes down here. And obviously, that's excluding the mean. So I'm going to go ahead and take that out. Now, I actually want to go ahead and test that, the solubility in concentrated sulfuric acid. Or you may see people writing maybe 95% sulfuric acid, so relatively concentrated, if not super concentrated. So then, this is, we're not really testing the solubility anymore, but more or less we're testing their reactions from now on. So this thing, if this does dissolve, if it does react, you will see the reactions kind of being happening here. So if it does dissolve, and then versus it's not going to be doing anything, no reactions, or I could say insoluble or no reaction. Uh, so one that really would dissolve or would do some sort of reaction with the HTSO4, remember you can do a lot of reactions with uh, alkene alkynes, the sulfuric acid would react with it, uh, even the alcohols, the ketones, and esters, a lot of these guys, they actually have the potential to react with them. Um, so they would fall into this category here. So I'm not going to take out the alkyl halides first for a minute. But then the rest of these guys could have the potential to react with the sulfuric acid. So it kind of puts in that particular category. And obviously, they do have an upper limit of how many carbons they can typically have. And it typically runs up to maybe 9 to 10 carbons, especially with these guys right there, maybe 9 to 10 carbons on those. And after that, it's a little bit iffy, but that's just a general rule. But if it doesn't really do anything to sulfuric acid, what you could possibly have? Well, you could possibly have a saturated hydrocarbon, like some sort of alkane. You could even have just an um, aromatics that uh, basically nonpolar aromatics, I would say. They don't really have any sort of function groups on them. So that's uh, that's what really going to be your um, category in there. And in addition to that, you could very well have alkyl halides. So all, your, all of your alkyl halides and even all of your aryl halides would be in this category because they wouldn't really react with anything. They would not dissolve in water either. So that's what you're really looking for in terms of characterizing these uh, groups in terms of the solubility. And you know, a lot of times you may just fall into having a small compound and maybe having it right here. So then you kind of uh, and in a good hand, you don't have to kind of go through all those things. But if you don't, then you're going to have to end up getting, um, you will end up getting uh, all these things um, going in this chart here. The last thing I really want to talk about is the salts of organic compounds. So, so salts of organic compounds actually uh, would dissolve in water. So I'm going to be putting those in right here. And uh, we don't really know what kind of uh, nature they're really going to have, whether they're going to be acidic or basic in terms of pH. But they do dissolve in water. That's just because they got a positive and negative charge. Uh, technically, they are on a compound at that point. So they could be either the salts of um, carboxylic acids or they could be the salts of um, amines. So anything like that. And even like, you know, amino acids and all those things that do dissolve in water. And we don't really know what their pH is going to be until we actually do the thing because they you know depending on whether they have both function groups or just one function groups their pH could be either acidic or basic so I do want to say that they are going to be right here and there is really not a um, limit on those uh, in terms of carbon so because I, I could technically talk about fatty acids and sometimes you know if the fatty acids are deprotonated they would dissolve in water it doesn't matter how long the hydrophobic chain is because as soon as you get the charge they would dissolve in water. A typical range for in a in you know, the number of carbon atoms and having a negative positive charge and still be soluble in water would be up to 25 carbons. So as opposed to having only five to six carbons in the typical compounds, but as soon as you start getting the charge, we're looking at anywhere between 20 to 25 carbons with a charge and they still be able to dissolve in the water. All right.